got it. Hello, and welcome to I've Never Read Discworld. Uh, with myself, Andy Luke, the two flower who has never read Discworld. And um, PJ, do you want to introduce? And uh, PJ Hart, who I suppose in that analogy must therefore be Rincewind, the hapless and uh, slightly nefarious wizard who takes two flower on his adventures, acting as a guide, as Rincewind does, to Andy's... Um, virgin foray into the Discworld series. And every month or so, all being well, we're going to go through a different um, Discworld novel in chronological tonight. It's, or today, or this morning, Colour of Magic. And um, yeah, so PJ, do you want to give us a bit of an overview of it? Sure. So um, hopefully if you've stumbled across this podcast, you might have some kind of idea of what this world is. Um, if you don't and you are looking for something new to read, as Andy was, uh, the Discworld series is a series of uh, satirical comedic fantasy novels, uh, the first of which is The Colour of Magic. Uh, which was written by Sir Terry Pratchett and published in 1983. It is the first of many. Um, I should have the full list in front of me, but I don't. I think the final running number is over 40 uh, books set on the Discworld, which, again, if you don't know, you probably do, is a flat planet uh, which rides on the back of four elephants, which are in turn carried on the back of a giant turtle which is flying through space. So just your average, normal, everyday, down-to-earth stuff. Mm. So I've never read Discworld. Um, I have read about, uh, I've read Good Omens. I read the Truckers, Diggers, Wings trilogy. This was about 25 years ago. Um, I used to live um, in the same building as a builder named Robin. And we used to go up to hang out with him in the evenings. And, and he al always had a Discworld novel in his hands and voiced those upon me. So um, That's awesome. So you're not um, unaware of the work of Terry Pratchett. You're not like coming into this with zero expectations. Like you have read his other work. You just haven't read his biggest work. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I knew he's, uh, Discworld is fantasy with a, comedic element to it and um everybody i've heard from about it is you should read this you should absolutely um, and is that what put you off because i know sometimes like the more like people push at you to like engage in a particular piece of pop culture or something like sometimes it can make you recoil is that what happened or what kind of what um, caused this delay so it was it was pretty much just not having the the time, there's so many books. Um, I've got this, this bookcase that has uh, just like sentience in the books and it just grows and grows and, and it needs a new form. And um, yep, yeah, so, I hear you. So no no space for Discworld until now on, on the, the ever metamorphosizing bookshelf. I get that. And I should probably mention um, as we go, so and Andy is the new reader. I'm ostensibly the old reader of Discworld, but uh, there are gaps in my reading of Discworld. Um, just from like an emotional comfort point of view, from like a psychological point of view, like I always liked the idea that I could reach for a Discworld book that I haven't read because uh, they've been with me for the last 25 years, give or take. Um, so the idea that they could run out um, kind of upsets me a little bit, kind of scares me. So uh, it's time to kind of rip the plaster off for me, I think. And I'm uh, I'm going to commit to to finishing the series along with Andy as he reads it for the first time. So there are books that we'll come to that I will be quite fresh to, but will probably have a different perspective and a different kind of feeling about uh, than Andy will. So that, that will be interesting when we get to those. I have read The Color of Magic, but interestingly, for me, but unhelpful for our podcast format, <laughs> is that I only read it for the first time about uh, six months ago. Um, and, and the re I will, I will, I'll discuss the reasons for that uh, later on. So 
I think the kind of first thing to do, Andy, if you're amenable, is to jump in uh, and get get those real raw first impressions from him because this isn't just the first time he's read The Color of Magic. This is the first time he's read any Discworld book. It's not the first time he's read any Terry Pratchett book. Uh, when was the last time he read a Terry Pratchett book, Andy? It probably would have been, well, well, actually just before this podcast, I by chance happened upon a copy of Strata, uh, which I think is Pratchett's third novel. And it's kind of like a, a prototype of Discworld. Yeah. Uh, and there's so many commonalities in terms of um, story beats, Pratchett, um, what might be Pratchett archetypes, a whole general idea of the the uh, the disc, it is a disc world on the back of a giant turtle with the elephants. And, um, but so that was like about a month within the last month. But before that okay. would have been Good Omens. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. A few years after it was released. So, oh, wow. Really? Okay. Late 90s, is that? Uh, it's earlier than that. Um, I could consult consult the internet on that one if you if you so desire but i have a feeling that good omens is earlier than you'd think considering how kind of good good it is and how kind of prescient it, it still feels and obviously with the the tv series and and all that uh do you want to guess again what did you guess there late 90s do you want to, do you want to guess again before i gave you the answer uh 95 I'm just going to pause for a second. My chair is stuck on some bubble wrap and it's making a horrendous noise. Um, I'm not actually, I'm not, not joking about that. 1995, you're out by a total of five years, 1990. Uh -huh. So yeah, so as I say earlier than you might think, considering how, what, what a great piece of satire it is. So, so you reckon the last, so before you read Strata last month, the last time you read a Pratchett book was in the mid nineties? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So yeah, here we are. A lot's changed in the intervening 20, 20 years, 18 years, let's say 18 years. Um, so that that's a, a, as good a place as any, I suppose, to to start getting some first impressions on The Color of Magic. Yeah, do you want to tell um, us a little bit about what happens in it before you tell us how you feel about it? Yeah, let's do. Uh, so it's ostensibly the story of Rincewind, the magician who is um sort of a weary cynic um who knows his areas of the discord quite well and um he is joined by two flower who is a um tourist a very enthusiastic tourist um and they, the two of them have a, a sort of a wonderful um back and forward there's just a, a little quote i have beside me um too far, too flower was a tourist, the first ever seen on the disc world. Tourist, once Rincewind had decided, meant idiot. <laughs> and yeah. the the two of them and um, Rincewind's luggage. Um, Rincewind serves as two flowers guide to the disc world. Um, and they cross a number of different terrains and encounter um trees living trees and temples dragons pub brawls and the edge of the world so it's like a hit list of, of fantasy tropes i'm hearing dragons i'm hearing barbarians i'm hearing i'm hearing like it's somebody's taken off of the whole um you know jrr talking um conan the barbarian hit list that's kind of what's happening is it i guess i guess it is i haven't really thought about it like that but it's oh, jumped um, the gun oh, it's dear. subverted uh, and it, it's just with this sort of wacky wonderful palette and mix of stuff and things so i will will we hold off on revealing the ending or the type of ending that this book has or um, let's let's hold off for a little while okay so uh, so we know now you're, uh, and I have to mark you down, unfortunately, as your uh, as your Discworld professor, that the, the luggage belongs to Two Flower, not not to Rincewind. <laughs> oh, I'm just going to cut that, cut that, cut that. Yeah, no, well, you definitely cut it. Yeah, <laughs> depends how depends how much sass you want from me in this. Um, so that's where they begin the journey that they go on. Yeah, as I say, 
as you've mentioned, takes them on a bit of a whirlwind tour of all these um, really recognizable fantasy tropes. Um, and I was just going to maybe check in with you to see which of those was the highlight or what, what your kind of bright spot in, in the color of magic was. Um, so it's, it's four parts, the color of magic, the sending of eight, the lure of the worm and close to the edge. Um, I, the lure of the worm deals with the dragons, which are imaginary. And that kind of jumped out at me. I like the idea of, um, this is my, my opinion on ghosts. If you don't believe in ghosts, they're not real. And, um, and, uh, it, uh, transparent dragons and there's a, a wonderful scene where um, our characters are in a, a giant cavern and there's just dragons roosting everywhere and um, so yeah I think that was that was certainly one of the highlights although the the closer where they reach uh, the edge of the world um, has, has a lot of great stuff in it I mean Pratchett adores his puns it seems uh, the rimbo the <laughs> circumference it's tough to i mean we could just you could fill an hour easily by just um by just pinging great quotes and great turns of phrase uh from any pratchett book uh including this one you know back back and forth with each other and, and you know your your quote about um <laughs> about tourists meaning idiot is like something we can all relate to like we've all been tourists and we've all been idiots but like that but the specific scenario of there being a tourist in a fantasy world where there are dragons and barbarians and that stuff like that's you know it, it, it works on that level too obviously because that's that's the concept that's of this book that so yeah i think it it almost goes without saying that the, even in this early early novel or early-ish novel i suppose um that yeah the the turn the turns of phrase are uh are great a lot of the comedy comes from that um from the kind of plays on words um and this will be slightly fresher in your head than mine i read an electronic version actually of the color of magic which i think is the first time i read a discworld book not on paper um so i was jump so when you, i don't know if anybody ever does this but um Discworld books are quite famous for having a lot of footnotes, right? And the footnotes are in the voice of the author. And reading them electronically, there's like a, a teeny tiny asterisk that you have to try to click with your finger and then it jumps you to the end of the book and then you read the footnote and then you have to try to click it again and it brings you back to the page and it, it kind of takes a bit of the fun out of reading a Terry Pratchett book for me. So because of that, my memory of like how many footnotes there are in the color of magic is is kind of fuzzy now so there's, do you want to remind me does it does he use know, a lot in that one i think there's only one um, oh really i i think it's one well, i could be could be just out but um it's a longer one it's fairly near the beginning oh yeah okay um strata actually has quite a few um so I footnotes coming Yes, um, more footnotes coming, and uh, in qual in terms of quality and quantity, uh, you'll be uh, very pleasantly surprised as as we move forward. That's interesting. Um, I can't quite remember where I was going with that though. Uh, what was I talking about before? Why did we get into the footnotes? Footnotes. Um, you were reading the electronic version, and uh, yeah, but why was I even talking about that? Why not? Why not? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, I was going with summer with it. It's gone though. It's it's lost. It's gone over the edge. Um, well, the you know, reading uh, Color of Magic put me in mind of um, Douglas Adams. I'm not sure what the chronology is there. Um, this is a good question. So, 1983 for this. Um, can hear hear me cheating. You hear my my key clicks as I cheat. Uh, yeah, Hitchhiker's Guide is is gonna say 70s. I just. Because I'm always, my, my Hitchhiker's chronology is fuzzy because it's radio and then it's book, isn't it? They did the radio play first. Oh. I believe. Or it was concurrent or something like that. Anyway, yeah. So Hitchhiker's Guide is like five years before Discworld, give or take. 
Um, and yeah, the influences are there. But, you know, funny you mentioned Strata. Uh, so I was sort of in preparation for this, flicking through Strata again, because I have a hard copy of it. I was reminded a great deal about how, how similar it feels to um, the Hitchhiker's Guide. And then not so much. So with my reading of initial reading of Discworld, you I started reading it like 20 plus years ago. I was aware of Douglas Adams. I had read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or I, or I read it around the same time. And I don't remember like that clicking like as immediately then that like, oh yeah, this is for fantasy, what Hitchhiker's is for sci-fi. But reading The Color of Magic last year with a bit of distance perhaps, or maybe it's just because that's almost how Discworld originated maybe. And I I feel, I agree with you essentially that, um, that, that, that that kind of comparison is easier to make with this earlier stuff, certainly with The Color of Magic. If, she, if somebody pitched this book to me and said, yeah, it's like a fantasy hitchhiker's guide, I'd be like, yeah, because I mean, to Flora is a tourist. He's, you know, the, even that kind of yeah. comparison between a hitchhiker and a tourist, you know, it's like you've, you've got that, that it's a, that idiot's guide kind of thing where you have this like hapless character just rolling into this insane world and then you, you get taken along on the ride. So it is very comparable well, in that sense, isn't it? One of, one of the interesting things about this is how um, uh, to Flora isn't so much our perspective characters very few scenes that are just too far alone it's it's rinse windy the old maid that we are with that introduces us to stuff and things and um it really shows off how much thought and work pratchett has seemed to have put into this while preparing um i don't i don't know how much there was in terms of like story bibling um before this although strata definitely is like a seems like a first draft in a different genre yeah for sure and it's interesting to me when you talk about yeah the the planning or um or outlining of of color of magic i mean it, it feels very episodic in a way that no spoilers um that later Discworld books don't i suppose and I wonder, did you get that impression? Did um, were you expecting it to be as episodic as it was? Um, no. Well, back to Strata again. It has no mm. chapter breaks. Mm. Um, so when I hit the uh, the, the first one in this um, for the um, sending of the eight, sending of eight prologue, I was just it kind of flew up at me, and it was a, a pleasant surprise. Okay, a pleasant surprise. That's interesting. Good to know. Um, I don't know then how you'll feel uh, as we move forward through the series because very, very few of the books are uh, delineated into chapters. Uh, and I think that's probably your experience of reading the other other Pratchett works that you'd read in the past. Good Omens is, though, I think. But yeah, I could be wrong about that. Maybe that's maybe more um, Gaiman's influence then, perhaps. Who knows? Uh, that is interesting. So... So we like we like the fact that it's broken down into chapters. We like the fact that we get to see lots of different fantasy stuff. I know that the dragons were a highlight. Were there any of those kind of fantasy tropes that like didn't land for you? Or? Um, no, no. I mean, the book didn't set my world on fire, but I mm. really enjoyed reading it. Um, it was really pleasant. I often feel fantasy takes its well, the fantasy I've been exposed to in the in terms of the the D and D barbarians, elves, all that stuff, I've often felt it takes itself much too seriously, and I I, I just experienced that sense of fun that Sir Terry is having with it. Yeah, I and mean, in this day and age, I suppose, like you're right, obviously, that especially on the literary side of things, that uh, it's a genre that has has its roots in some pretty heavy writing with Tolkien and stuff like that. Um, with like, you know, made up languages and 
fake histories and all that kind of stuff. And it's obviously great to see something that plays with that, makes fun of that. Um, but in this day and age, you know, reading this book that came out in 1983, as we sit here in, um, in 2022, in a heavily saturated postmodern world where pop culture eats itself on an annual basis and you know we par par parodies of things come out before the dust has even settled on on the thing that they're parodying um is the impact of disc world diminished in any kind of sense just because it maybe we're used to that we're used to that level of irony and that level of parody in this kind of in the postmodern or the post postmodern um uh cultural pop cultural landscape that we're we're in at the minute yeah it's all gone madly marvel lately hasn't it well yeah that's a little bit what i'm getting at, i think i mean yeah in a world where we have, we have deadpool you know taking the mech out of out of marvel on on the cinema screen to the tune of millions of dollars does like a book like disc world which is doing the same thing but for fantasy 30 years ago is that right? 40 years ago, 40 years ago on a, on a much smaller scale. Does, does, do you feel that had you read this when you read good omens, if you, if this was the next book that you picked up after good omens, would it have had a bigger impact on you than it did today? I think probably. Yeah. Um, what I was expecting when I went into this was about that time. I was reading a lot of, uh, Peter David's, work uh star trek novels and his his comics work of course and they were very quick easy reads but they were so full of humor and plot twistiness and i kind of expected that from color of magic um i i don't think it it gave me that it felt like there was a it, it took longer than i imagined to get through um mm. it was what prom what was promised uh there's some lovely concept in there and it was a lot of fun yeah there's stuff i'm sure you'll not be surprised to learn that there's stuff in there that we revisit in the series and i don't want to be like giving too much away or front loading too much stuff i'm really really pleased that your highlight is the the dragon riders and the and that concept that if that imagination is what makes mythical creatures or mythical concepts real in this world uh because that's something again without giving too much away hopefully uh that's a concept that we revisit in a in a few of my real highlights my and my absolute favorite disc world books that's a concept that that's going to come back in a really really big way uh, a couple of different ways and a couple of different books so i'm looking forward to having that conversation with you again because that's an idea that gets fleshed out really, really well in this series. Um, oh, I remembered why I was asking you about the footnotes, I think. I don't know if I left enough of a pause there to edit that back, but we could always try. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I read it recently uh, myself, and I used to say I got, I got it from the, the electronic lending section of my local library, uh, join your library. Um, but I was curious to know, in what format that you had read it this time? Well, I um, actually, one of the reasons for approaching about this PJ is my brother, Gavin. Hello. Um, Hello, Gavin. Burdened on me like 15 Discworld novels because um, he had extra copies. So I have the 1985 Corgi edition with that oh, beautiful yes. wraparound Josh Kirby cover, uh, which are just so iconic. Yeah, that's good to know. Most of the, well, interestingly, I think my own collection so is going to get very book nerdy now, but it seems like the right kind of podcast right, to do that, nice, on, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, about half my collection would be those editions. And then the other half would be hardbacks as they were released, because I kind of got into that stage where like, I was super hungry for New Discworld and I actually, the only author I would ever buy a hardback book of as it was released as a teenager, you know, when that was like real money that had to be spent. So um, in a weird way though, those uh, those Corgi editions with the, the Josh, Josh Kirby, I want to say, is that right? 
Yeah. Yeah, with the Josh Kirby uh, illustrations. Like, they are iconic, as you say. Um, if you haven't seen them, it's not a great discussion to have on, in, in the audio medium, perhaps. But they they are, as, as Andy alludes to, they're these real, like, they're wraparound covers, so that's, there's so much going on in these covers. He's holding it up to the screen to be now. Just so I don't you know, know if we're getting a I, video I, version, but I can't see it super well. Um, but basically, how would, I'm not I'm not much of an art guy, um, but they're almost overwhelming. Like there's so much going on in the artwork, Andy. Right? Yeah. So, like I've talked to people about the books, or like I've shown them to my wife or whatever, and she's kind of put off by them by those covers, you know, because oh. it's just like it's a sensory overload. There's too much going. Like I don't know what this book's about because there's like five thousand things going on on this cover, and it is it's something kind of ugly about his art style. Like it's intentionally ugly. It's like a Punch and Judy kind of style, almost. You know, because it, it's satirical. Because they're satirical books, right? It's kind of weird to to find something so iconic yet so detailed, because yes. it, they're just traffic. They're it must be the colors that there's unless we've got like barbarians standing at the top of a, a cavern with a stairwell down it and a figure rushing down towards the sort of crate of uh, gold um, two flowers luggage with its uh, hundreds of little feet underneath and and the that's something we should talk about actually and it's um sorry to interrupt your very vivid description of, of the cover um but that's a character like a character we've talked about Rincewind uh, a little bit we've talked about two floor a little bit um how did you react to meeting the luggage tell us uh, about the luggage tell us who the luggage is yes uh the luggage is two floors luggage with which likes to bite people um which produces lots of lots of very expensive gold coins um and it's kind of an unstoppable force as well. Um, and there's also a uh, Two Flowers camera, which oh, yes. I adore. Um, the camera, can, cameras are new in the disc world. Um, and the camera has a little demon in it that uh, maybe knocks off occasionally for a good working class smoke break. Um, it's very wise, sarcastic. Um, I really hope we see more of the camera. Yeah, well, again, not to spoil too much of Discworld for you, but I'm sure as certain details have come into your orbit via osmosis anyway. So just that idea, that concept, uh, that technology on the disc is basically tiny little creatures just working, just like doing a day's work, doing a day's graft. So like, so when Andy says that the demon, if you don't know, if you're coming into this, um, blind the way he was uh when he says that the demon works the camera it's not powered it's not a mechanical camera that's powered by a demon there's like a little dude inside the camera drawing the pictures <laughs> and he's got little paints and all the rest of it and you know if he spills if he spills the purple then you can't have purple in your photos anymore you know so uh so yeah so at this stage and again wary of spoilers but at, at this stage in the technological development of this world that's how stuff gets done and it is it's a great, it's a great, it's a great conceit. Um, one of, one of the highlights for me, and I was, I was interested having read a lot of Discworld, but not this book. Uh, I was really yeah, pleasantly surprised to see that concept already in place, you know, book one chapter, if not chapter one, certainly very early, uh, from what I recall. And that kind of, uh, as you say, I know, I know you're, you've alluded to a couple of times that like, this it, this book didn't blow your mind like it's not it's ha it hasn't entered your top 10 favorite books i imagine but despite that you know we can feel or hopefully you you can certainly feel that like a really really good groundwork is being laid here right oh fantastic um it's just utterly it feels like utterly solid world building um and in a in a kind of way that I kind of suspect that the the next lot of books aren't going to rest on that. It's going to keep 
powering along. I, I get that. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, yeah, if, considering, like, as I say, I was surprised by how episodic this book was. And I suppose that, like, I knew I've read other books with Rince Wind and Two Flower in them. Uh, so I know the conceit of those characters. So I shouldn't have been surprised that we we got to see quite a lot of the disc in this book, I guess. Like, they go on a tour. He's a tourist. That's what happens. Um, But as you say, there's a lot a lot more to come you know it's, it's it's a whole world and you know we start in the city of Ankh-Mor Pork and that's that's where a lot of the stories that you're going to read are going to either be entirely or partially or primarily set and I was wondering what you made of it as a setting of like this idea of like a fantasy metropolis isn't kind of something that we come across in the more serious fantasy literature all that much. Like they're not living, like the people in this world aren't living in some castle like the the elves in uh, in Lord of the Rings or whatever. Like they, they live in a, what is essentially a fantasy version of London with all the, the grit and the grime that comes with that, right? Yeah, I felt we got... We got the lead in with the docks, with two floors arrival, and then there seemed to be a lot of time spent in the tavern and the, the sort of the moss isliness of it all. Um, and that's kind of key for me anyway, like that idea that, yeah, is it, it's, it's still the mended drum in this version, isn't it? Or is it the broken drum? Oh, I've got the broken drum in this. Oh yeah, it goes one way, so it's, <laughs> Starts as the broken drum and then becomes the mended drum, or vice versa. So in the color of magic, it's the broken drum, right? Yeah, I think so. So then, what happens happens. I don't, still not sure how much we're giving away in this, but we'll we'll figure it out. There's a fire. <laughs> yeah, it gets a little bit and, loud. Yeah, things go down, and then uh, when we see the pub again, which we do in many many Discworld books, it then becomes the mended drum. And it's one of those kind of ongoing Discworld gags. But what I was going to say about the kind of that Moss Eisley kind of gritty, the Dungeons and Dragons, dark tavern where the adventure begins kind of vibe. That's that's like another kind of trope that we're playing with in this book, right? Yeah, I felt that whole section was quite slowly paced. And then we we fairly much we go through the book and we get the forests and uh, the caverns and temples and in the end of the world um so you were but, you were happy to get out of the city then is that what you're saying yeah i i thought it was a bit of a i, th I think it did works to the book's advantage um the first the tavern element seems to take much more time i suppose for a for a setup it would but it's it raises an element of what i love about practice writing here it's the description he mm. is painting a full canvas and adding in a commentary with that there's so many beautiful paragraphs yeah do you have any favorites any do you want to, do you want to drop some quotes on us any favorite quotes um, there's kind of along the way there's um there's there's a few moments where he breaks a fourth wall and it's you know, it's it seems like he's talking directly to the reader. And of course, all authors are absolutely talking directly to the reader. Mm -hmm. um, and he's he's talking about a theme of the book, which is which is magic. Um, and his role as a creator in that. Um, the disc gods themselves, despite the splendor of the world below them, are seldom satisfied. It is embarrassing to know that one is a god of a world that only exists because every improbability curve must have its far end, especially when one can peer into other dimensions at worlds whose creators have more mechanical aptitude than imagination. It's um, great. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, the gods, the gods are involved in this book. It's something we haven't touched on yet. Uh, but yeah, the idea that that's where we are that's where these stories take place is that it's at the end of an improbability curve is a a, a beautiful concept 
and that's, do, that's okay. more a thematic example of what I was talking about. Um, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, but, there's, there's lavish descriptions of plenty. And, um, you can really picture it. Um, Strata was a very dense sort of novel. Mm. Um, and you, you don't always get the same opportunity to just, just absolutely delicious um, descriptions. Yeah, I'm fuddling I'm about a bit, but it's, it's something this, this book has in, in spades, uh, the canvas and the commentary. Absolutely. And a lot of that, like that quote that you just, um, you just read out, comes from this chess game that's happening throughout the book. It's like this Bergman style chess game between gods where uh, one of them's a crocodile, I want to say. <laughs> it's a yeah. crocodile god. I, I can't remember what the other one is. Um, and they are essentially toying with the lives of the mortals in that kind of Greek, Greek god kind of way. And that connects to something else that we haven't um, mentioned yet, which is the fact that Rincewind, the reason he's such a terrible wizard is because he can't learn spells. And the reason he can't learn spells is because he has one of the original eight spells in his head. It got stuck in his head. So from a mythological point of view, like in terms of like the machinations of gods, he's actually like kind of a big deal because he has this spell stuck in his head. Oh, right. So, yeah. So I can't. I hope, I hope I'm not spoiling stuff. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's all in there in the color of magic. It's not yeah, a huge. Yeah, I just it's not a, knotted it together. Um, yeah. I know you, it's not a huge plot point as such. It's just something that's. It's kind of set up. It's like it's it's part of his kind of gag origin story, and that like he's a crap wizard, but there is sort of a reason for it. Uh, and then the other reason for it, in my view, um, is to get out of jail free card. It's a Deus Ex Machina for like. Every time Rince Wind should die, he doesn't <laughs> because he's got the spell that's in his head is so powerful it won't let him die, which obviously leads him to have all these confrontations with death, the character of death who crops up a couple of times yeah, in the color so of I'm magic, right? Yeah, uh, and I, I noticed the, the mounting Deus Ex Machinas and I, I didn't mind so much. It yeah. usually really bugs me. To, but just because they were so much fun yes and they help they keep things ticking over in this one right and i and any time where you get arrive at a place in the book where we get to have those scenes with the the, the personification of death because that's like it's like i'm sure you knew going in that that death is one of pratchett's yeah. iconic characters one of the one of the other things actually that sort of those leaps in narrative um, remind me of a, a show I've got a love-hate relationship with, which is Red Dwarf. Oh, yeah. um, I, I particularly love the earlier sort of Samuel Beckett, Waiting for God O style um, narrative choices uh, with the really inventive sci-fi stuff, but the later, the really popular stuff, the sort of the wacky adventures yeah. just are a bit too wacky for me. And I, I see a lot of this in, in Color of Magic, but it's it's all like working really well. Um, yeah. It, it, it feels sort of, yeah, it, I, I can't explain why I, I um, pref prefer Pratchett's approach or what he does particularly that works, but it it's interesting. I think it's something as you get deeper into the series, that probably will start to crystallize for you. So um, I and just want to run you through our, our no, sorry, go ahead. And and another I'll, thing I noticed, I've got a note here that's also similar to what Red Dwarf is trying to do. Uh, it's composed with UK kids humor comic element, though it's yeah. played with nuance, I think. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's out there on the global stage. The series is out there on the global stage, waving the flag for our sense of humor, you know, for something that's quite peculiar to this part of the world. And I think there are books in the series that exemplify it better, for sure. Um, but 
you know, you start where you start and, uh, and this is, it's, it's a relatively strong start, I think. And I, having hesitated to read it for so many years, you know, I wasn't sure what to expect going in. Uh, and I tried to adjust my expectations accordingly. Uh, and I ended up being kind of pleasantly surprised, su pleasantly surprised because, um, because of what you just said, all that stuff was already there. That, that sense of humor, um, it's so well realized. It's so self-assured already. Yeah. It's, it's pretty bonkers that you've got, um, like a Kring, this, um, really annoying sarcastic sword, but, or, you know, the luggage with legs, but after, you know, you, you kind of sort of fairly accept the, the ludicrousness of it, which is, um, it's some feet. Um, Absolutely, yeah, and the luggage certainly has some feet, as we know. Uh, <laughs> if you're trying trying a bit of project <laughs> wordplay here, it's not working. No, <laughs> stick stick to the books, guys. Uh, so, without again trying to spoil too much stuff for you, I want to run th through some of the characters in this book that we're going to meet again and get a sense of how excited you are or are not to meet them again or spend more time with them. So. The first one's obviously Rincewind. Yes, I, I really like Rincewind. Um, he's a character who's made a stupid mistake and he's been paying for it since. He's got a, that weary old voice. Society doesn't count him as authentic um, as a magician, but he, hang, he seems to hang on to the work he's put into gaining that status, even though the knowledge is pretty much useless because of the great big spell. Um, I, I find him a very sympathetic character. So I'm I'm looking forward. I think I'm going to get more Rincewind pretty soon. Yep, good to know. Um, weirdly for me, Rin Rincewind put me off big time back oh. in the day. Yeah. So I didn't read The Color of Magic originally, but I did read The Light Fantastic, which is the next book. Uh, and give, given where The Color of Magic ends, it's a cliffhanger. It's like a literal, oh yeah, proper Terry Pratchett <laughs> style, like literal cliffhanger. So, so maybe that didn't help that I didn't have the full context um, when I read *The Light Fantastic*. But I find that like that kind of cowardly character that like I get the humor of now, but like as a kid when I was like eleven years old, I was like, that's not what I want as the protagonist in my fantasy novel. You know, I want somebody cool or somebody who's like hardcore or somebody who's like you know not not this like whimpering yellow bellied wizard who can't even do magic like that's not what i want when i'm 11 years old and i'm reading a fantasy novel so that put me off a little bit at the time uh, and obviously eventually i kind of got over that and i circled back around but i'm glad that like people who don't have my hang-ups are like reading rincewind that are like immediately uh, becoming endeared to him and aren't, aren't aren't kind of judging him with their own baggage in the way I did when I was a kid, you know. <laughs> so uh, so what about two flower? How how are we feeling about two flower? Yeah, two flower is annoying, but in just the right measure. Yeah, agreed. I think, and that, and that was my experience at the time as well. Is like rinse wind was kind of making me cringe quite a lot, uh, and that kind of made two flower seem more bearable. I think by uh, by comparison, and. But yeah, he, he has it where it counts and he gets Rincewind out of a lot of trouble. It gets him into a lot of trouble as well. So maybe it balances out. Yeah, his enthusiasm uh, is just adorable. Yeah, that's it too, isn't it? You know, it's it's hard to stay mad at him. Whereas I think for me, <laughs> it's easier to stay mad with Rincewind <laughs> for whatever reason. Uh, now, there's some characters that you maybe haven't thought about a lot who crop up in this book who you are going to meet again. So if you don't have any big impressions of them at the moment, that's okay. Uh, but what about the patrician? who sets Rincewind his task. So the patrician yeah. is the is the leader, he's the despot of Ankmore Park. He's a, he's a dictator, but he, he runs the city as a benevolent big dictator. And he gives Rincewind the task of basically making sure that Two Flower comes to no harm. Comes to no harm. And then there's a moment where the patrician or somebody in the circle decides that Two Flower should come to harm. And this yes. leaped out at me as a sort of a one of the few unintentional seemed like one of the few unintentionally unresolved plot threads, but 
it's yeah lovely. i'm saying nothing yeah i'll absolutely say nothing uh the fact that i've um i've mentioned that he's gonna you know the patrician is a a character that, that looms large lord lord veterinary is involved in pretty much every Discworld story certainly all the ones that are set in Ankmore park and it's a it's a fan favorite for for many people it doesn't get much to do in this book but has maybe more to do going forward so definitely keep an eye on him uh and then i guess the last one to think about well no two more uh cohen the barbarian he turns up right uh Hon Haron? oh no a different barbarian spoilers oh. forget forget about the other barbarian um but there is a weird barbarian fascination in these early books like there's like definite multiple barbarians that are, are out there doing barbarian stuff and that's not that's not something we see in like the netflix or amazon prime um fantasy shows that much is it you know like it feels it, it does it date it this barbarian thing does it feel a bit more 80s or something i don't know i had fun with from um he's a nice balance between a uh an idiot and a hero and a yeah, like a, a genuinely for good sort of force. Um, and there's his marriage with um, the Yessa, is it? Yes, that's right. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to her run reappearance. Yep, I'll, I'll, I'll keep Stim on that. There's definitely other barbarians in the mix as well. So you'll get your barbarian fix one way or another going forward. And then the last one, the big one for a lot of Discworld fans is death. Death. Um, mm, maybe it's because I've just been binging the Sandman on Netflix. Oh yeah. Um, and, and death is so wonderful there. Um, that besides a typeface, death hasn't really jumped out at me yet. Um, yeah, that's totally fair. I think um, what's interesting especially in comparison to like more well-realized versions of the character in other semi-adjacent works like Salman, is that the foundations for death as a character rather than as a plot device are still kind of being laid in this book, I suppose. And that was a bit of a disappointment for me, I think, going back to it after having read so many of the other books, especially the ones where death is almost like a protagonist, is that like he does he doesn't kind of he doesn't feel like himself yet i guess you know he's this this concept of him as actually a as a being with a personality is still not quite there but bear with it i would say definitely so i've got some questions for you is this world means. a sociological story I mean, class gender expounded theories um yes <laughs> it's a short answer, but I mean, it, it, it absolutely is. Um, I would be interested to know how much of that you picked up from this book, because I don't know how much of it is really on display, but maybe some of that groundwork is, is being laid. I would, I would say like, you'll, you'll get, we'll get to books in this series where like, from, from the first 10 pages you'll get the sociological issue that is being discussed in this book. And there's a great many of the books where it's like taking aim at a specific issue or like a handful of issues. And I mean, for me, this doesn't feel like one of them, I guess. And that's totally fair because it's the first book in the series. But did you get a sense that that groundwork was being laid, I wonder, or? Um. I mean, I, I guess we could be talking about like a kind of a spiritual sociology. Um, I, so I'm, I'm, I've, I mean, I've seen the titles of most of the Discworld books and sure. I kind of feel that there might be coming down the line a sort of a kind of a fantasy version of The Wire where you have a different book looks at a different aspect of the Discworld. Um, that is an awesome replete with social commentary. Yeah, that's a that is an awesome sales pitch right there for this day and age. <laughs> like, yeah, if somebody told me that, I would be I'd be all over this series. And you know, and that's right. I mean, it, 
tonally isn't 100% right, of course, because this, this world will always be comedy at its heart. But but it is it is all encompassing in terms of looking at all, all facets of society. It looks at class. It looks at gender. It looks at technology. It looks at... It's particularly interested as we get to, certainly by the middle of the series, it's particularly interested in how technology changes society which is quite interesting and in fantasy world terms we're talking about things like newspapers steam engines um music musical developments so it's uh yeah I mean, ho hopefully none of those are spoilers because you've seen the titles of the books as you say so yeah so like a, a great many of the books are like tackling those subjects head on and for me like that's a lot of where Discworld you know is Discworld like that's that's why I think about when I think about Discworld uh, is those kind of questions and those kind of themes so these earlier books where they aren't so much on display are still super fun and the characters I guess are maybe more the focus and now that I've kind of made my peace with Winswind and we're friends again uh I could kind of spend a bit more time just with that kind of character driven humor and less on the big themes but when those big things come they're handled so well you know so, so something to look forward to i suppose uh hope that answers your question but it's a yes, resounding yes, yes. And, and also my next one about how prevalent is comedy through the series so we're, we're going to get into funnier funnier stuff yes again a resounding yes <laughs> the the beauty of a lot of it is that it's going to get funnier, but it's going to get heavier, I guess. Like, you're going to be a lot more invested in these characters and a lot more invested probably in some of the characters that you're yet to meet. Um, but they're still written with such heart and such humor. And and, and those go hand in hand, you know, if if, if you meet a character that you you care about and you fall in love with um because they make you laugh and you they're so relatable that obviously you're reading a fantasy story where they're going to be put in danger <laughs> and you know you're going to really really care about those stakes uh and about how, how how those people's lives are affected or whether they're even going to continue so uh yes again it's a resounding yes to that question would your um, opinion of Colour of Magic then be typical of um, uh, Pratchett fans? What do they place in the hierarchy? Yeah, I mean, it's low in the overall hierarchy. So it's a discussion that people in the fandom have a lot, even now, in terms of like... And you would imagine... Or, that like an author who's so well regarded and you know people would usually praise the consistency of the quality of their work that like it might be surprising that people generally don't recommend just starting from the start so there's varying skills of thought on like what this world book you should read first i mean the issue with not going in chronological order, I think, is that you could kind of end up where I ended up, which is then kind of in a bit of a muddle with and then missing out and not reading books that you should have read 20 years ago. <laughs> you yeah, know? you can't always have the internet to check these things. Well, back then, yeah, the now, luckily, we, we do have the internet to check it now. And I get the impression the light fantastic is going to be like a part two of two kind of thing maybe it is i mean as you say so it, it, it the color of magic ends on a big cliffhanger and the light fantastic picks up it's the next scene basically just picks up exactly where the color of magic <laughs> leaves off so that that's that's kind of known i guess as the, the start of the rincewind saga or the rincewind novels so he has a series that goes through it's like like nine or ten books, I want to say. Yeah, I understand he's one of the, the major characters. I've been devoutly trying to avoid most of the spoilers. And if you're getting in touch with us, um, please respect that. Don't 
don't tell me what big events happen and yeah if anybody's going to spoil it for him it's going to be me i'll try not to i'll try really hard not to of course so yeah so you've got about nine or ten rinse wind novels ahead of you where like he's the main character two floor is involved to varying degrees etc and then you've got the watch the city watch who are the police force of ankh pork you've got some witches who are hanging out in a different part of the disc and then as I alluded to earlier, Death gets his own kind of mini series of about half a dozen novels or so, where Death or, or Death's family are essentially the the main characters. So, uh, there's quite a strong feeling, and I'm, I'm biased in this one, um, that Guards Guards, which is the first of the city watch novels is like a quite a good introduction uh to the series so for me i read the light fantastic first and was kind of like okay didn't like change my life or whatever enjoyed it uh but then when i read guards guards that's where everything changed and i read those two books almost back to back so like the contrast for me was quite stark um i don't want to talk too much about guards guards now because obviously we're going to talk about it yeah but thoughts and feelings on that but those are those are two books that i think would be quite often recommended to start either the color of magic just ply through it and then you know go in publication order uh and it builds steam and at least if you do that you'll understand all the references you'll know why the mended drum is what's the broken drum and all that kind of stuff you'll get all those like little references that he throws in there and that's worth it or the other school of thought is get guards guards which is the start of a really good series but it also it starts at just like a little bit of a higher level like he's it's more self-assured it hits the ground running in a way that perhaps the rinse wind series doesn't and then uh once you get a few in uh guards guards men at arms and feet of clay are the first three city watch novels and then maybe once once you've got those under your belt and you're like, all right, I'm in this for the long haul and you understand about the disc and the wizards and everything. Uh, and I think you may have even meet Rincewind in passing. I can't remember, uh, but you certainly meet the other wizards in passing. Uh, then go back and, and, and ply through the color of magic and the light fantastic and, and kind of catch up that way. But so we're going to do these in uh, chronological order. Yeah, I think that 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 makes total sense because otherwise we'll get we could get lost in the woods pretty quickly. I'm, as we speak, looking at the reading order guide 2.0, which is on the lspace.org website, uh, and it's complicated. <laughs> it's a little bit complicated because it breaks them down into the various um, uh, character uh, series. So it's got rinse wind, and there's little dotted lines coming out and it intersects with witches and it's just like we get lost in this way too quickly we'll just go with publication order and and that way we can't get lost lspace.org would that be one of the um the respected pratchett sites absolutely yeah so it's a reference that probably hasn't didn't come up in the color of magic but i think will come up in delight fantastic uh, so the L in L space is library space. So the library in the Unseen University, which is the university that the wizards all hang out in. So it's a library full of magic books. It's where Rincewind got the spell stuck in his head. Uh, and obviously if you have a library full of magic books, weird stuff happens there. Time and space is a bit wobbly. So that's that's what L space is. So the, the kind of one of the online repositories for all things Discworld is lspace.org. So if you're in Andy's boots and you're kind of coming to Discworld relatively fresh and you want to check out some online resources, lspace.org is a good place to start. Super duper. Um, have we anything else to go through before we wrap up? Um, I want to talk a bit about um, the law. Um, the magical law put me in mind of Brandon Sanderson's Magical Laws, the oh, yeah. law of conservation of relativity, uh, which demanded that the effort needed to achieve a goal should be the same regardless of the means used. Um, in practical terms, this meant that, say, 
Creating the illusion of a glass of wine was relatively easy since it involved merely the subtle shifting of light patterns. On the other hand, lifting a genuine wine glass a few feet in the air by sheer metal energy required several hours of systemic, systematic preparation if the wizard wished to finish the simple principle of leverage flicking his brain out through his ears. Yeah, it's good. The way that he um, he approaches, yeah, he actually thinks about like how magic should work. It's not just like waving wands or, or saying Latin words or whatever. And I think it's particularly amusing that he's gone to all that effort but like his main wizard can't do any of it, <laughs> <You> <laughs> which is yeah. quite which is quite funny. But uh, we spend more time with the wizards, with like a full cast of wizards later, and there's a lot of allegory between magic and physics and other sciences and stuff like that. So his his kind of understanding of those laws, like laws of cause and effect and stuff like that, I guess, which is basically what what that quote's about. Um means that like that's like a really good foundation to build stories to use magic as an allegory to build stories that are about other things um without spoiling them too much but we did allude to it earlier i guess that you know technology coming into the disc and wizards on in disc world view technology in a certain way and it's all kind of based on, on those ideas that are, that, come, that are already starting to be talked about in this book. So I think that's, uh, it kind of shows you what you're in for in, in some ways, doesn't it? You know? Yeah, it gives it a nice sort of, uh, uh, a sort of link to reality. Um, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, and I, we probably won't touch on them, but I mean, there are, there are, a, a, there is a, sh there is a short series of books uh, called the science of Discworld where they do uh, i can't remember the scientists but they're co-written with a couple of round world that's our world scientists uh examining like various concepts from this world from a scientific perspective and that wouldn't even be possible if if sir terry hadn't have been thinking about magic in these kind of scientific terms with this kind of semi-scientific framework from the outset so that's quite fun oh cool any final thoughts pj um i was going I'm, back to it yeah final thoughts for me i'm glad that i finally got around to reading the color of magic and i'm looking forward to filling in the gaps in my disc world reading but i'm really really excited to get to some of my favorites i'm really really excited to hear what you think i think the first one that we're going to get to that really speaks to me is guards guards for sure so i'm really looking forward to that but I'm also really enjoying my kind of reacquaintance with Rincewind and like from the adult perspective. So Rincewind, I think, is meant to be like 40 years old. And I'm kind of getting to that age now. <laughs> and I kind of see how world weary he is. And I'm like, yeah, man, I get it. Like, I judged you when I was 11 years old. And I'm really sorry. <laughs> well, 11 year old, you know, knows nothing. Yeah. You whereas I, my love. Yeah, I like, I get it, dude. I'm sorry. I'm going to read all your books and we're going to have lots of fun. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I, I definitely get that. Age kind of toxifies you, I think, to, to some level or, or puts you, makes you vulnerable to that. And um... it's interesting. This is like, well, I, as I say, when we get to other books, there's like a kind of real guiding light of optimism in a lot of these books. And I think some, that's maybe actually something that kind of threw me about Rincewind originally as well as like he's easily the most cynical of the main, char main characters in these series, I think. And bearing in mind that one of the main characters in the series is literally death. That's kind of saying something, you know. So yeah, I mean, I definitely I can identify with him a lot more now, but it's something that that threw me initially like when we get to the guards the city watch series and we'll definitely be comparing rinse wind with vimes uh and yeah that's a conversation for another time but like you'll see when we meet vimes 
why I kind of maybe find it harder to go back and kind of um, relate with Prince Wind, I suppose. So The Light Fantastic in four weeks, this podcast should be available on Spotify, Google, iTunes, um, other places. Um, we're going to be on Twitter at Discord GNU and um, maybe Facebook, maybe Instagram. Let's uh, let's see. We'll have a search for us there and we'll be out um, there somewhere. Have a talk to us. Uh, Join in with us um, with Colour, Magic or Light Fantastic. Uh, don't send me spoilers, send them to PJ. Uh, yes, by all means, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at PJHart86, P-J-H-A-R-T-86 on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, I'm supposed to be writing all day, most days. So I welcome the procrastination opportunities. Uh, I will drop pretty much anything to talk about this world except my kids. So yeah, I welcome it. Bring it on. Let's do it. I'm about Twitter at Andrew Luke and also Facebook, Insta, the whole works. My Patreon's um, gone live again. It's patreon.com forward slash Andy Luke. Um, and my novel Occupied is out um, and it's really good. It's a comedy about camping and activism set in Belfast. I like all three of those things, so I'm excited. I'll hopefully not take 20 years to read that. Um, you've got uh, some stuff on Channel 5 I've been meaning to check out. Oh, I mean, if you're not like four years old, don't worry about it. <laughs> so I have a kid show going out on, a few episodes of a kid show going out on Channel 5 at the moment called Mimi's World. It's not an original creation of mine, but it is a lot of fun. If you've got children between the age of like three and seven, they might like it. It's got like cartoon dragons and stuff in it it's cool oh yeah i don't have anything else to plug at the minute i don't think hopefully before the end of the series i will have something else to plug okay i'll get working on that we'll if you don't there. distract me too much us writers need our meditative time well this is it all right uh cool yeah see ya i think this was hopefully as slightly underwhelming a start to the podcast as a color of magic was a slightly underwhelming start to the series where it's nothing thematically accurate. This, I mean, it was, it's, it was really hard. Like we, we, we wanted, we were going to make it good. And then we thought, no, no, we need to pull it back. You know, mm. we need to stay on theme. We need to stay on brand. Just, so uh, yeah. we'll get better as the series gets better, hopefully. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is, this is our, um, yeah. Oh, that was, that was a segue into like continuing the conversation when we're <laughs> actually been. ending it. <laughs> Um, so consider this a, a first of um, many, another part, maybe. Definitely. Uh, to be continued. All right, yes. Um, I'm going to go see if I can dig out a copy of The Light Fantastic. I'm going to get rereading it. So I will speak to you again. All right. Let's get on. Goodbye. I, just, I, don't, I don't know how to end the podcast. I have to, make, I have to let Andy do it. How do, how do you do it, Andy? Um, I've never read Discworld. But I have. See you next time. Oh, I have. <laughs> <laughs> that was can a we, Can we do a footnote? Can we, yeah. <laughs> cut that, cut that, cut that. <laughs>